So with this, I'd like to welcome Professor Wang. Thank you so much for being here.
but within a matter of a millimeter or so in the skin. It will transition into a later diffusive regime, which is almost isotropic, traveling in all directions, nearly equal, nearly isotropic. So this step is the transfer of the path, and that translates into a millimeter in the skin. So it's obviously tissue type dependent, but this is a very good estimate for scattered biological tissue, with the exception of the eye. So today we're going to focus on overcoming the diffusion problem. How do you get an image through a piece of relatively thick tissue? If you simply project light through, you will see the illumination photon path and detection photon path will both be tortuous. If you want to capture a shadow of the middle plane structure, you will not get it directly. Very different from X-ray projection, or eventually discovered x-ray by seeing an image first. So the light is totally the opposite. We've been seeing light forever, but it's hard to get a good image. If you cut open the tissue to expose the middle plane, now the detection photon path is very well defined, even though the illumination photon path is still tortuous. So one-sided clarity will be sufficient for you to get a good image. Now we're focusing on the detection side. You can think of other methods where you can make the illumination side clear, well defined to get a good image as well. But this is not useful for imaging because it's invasive. You can keep the tissue intact, but optically clear the right half of the tissue. And you would form a good image as well. You have to use osmotic agent, which is toxic. A much better idea is to convert light into sound because acoustic scattering is about a thousand times weaker than light scattering. All of a sudden you've achieved the equivalent to case B or case C without emissiveness or toxicity. So here we're simply listening to the sound induced by light. Light is absorbed which is converted into sound through the photoacoustic effect. So you're listening to an optical structure instead of looking at one. Right? This is the power of this technology. And you may ask, why do we bother with light? Well, the reason is that we want to have access to all these wonderful contrast mechanisms provided by light. Why don't we use ultrasound alone? If you use ultrasound, you can only access the mechanical properties. Right? So you have no access to the optical properties I just mentioned. So that's why we need a combination of light and sound into a single modality. Photoacoustic tomography is based on the physical phenomenon of photoacoustics, which was first reported over 100 years ago by Alexander Graham Bell. He had this idea of photophone instead of telephone. Of course, this idea never took off. The basic concept is to encode sound into a light beam, and propagate the light beam in space, and convert light back into sound again through the photoacoustic effect. Where light is first absorbed, inducing a temperature rise, due to the thermoelastic expansion, you would generate a crystal emission. Of course, today we're interested in the ultrasound frequency range because we want to shorten the wavelength for better spatial resolution. Now, Bell never used photoacoustics for imaging purposes. Remember, lexi we remember uh, tomography was not even in the lexicon over 100 years ago. So this is a very new concept in terms of 3D imaging. So we're using somewhat old physics in a very new imaging method. Photoacoustic computer tomography comes in various geometries as well. Let me talk about circular geometry first. You start by expanding your laser beam. Make sure you stay within the ANC safety limit. We start with a nanosecond pulse laser. So you want to make sure your laser is short enough. You know, there are some details about the, the pulse width selection we're not getting to tonight. So the key concept is you allow the photons to scatter because that's the only way to penetrate deep into biological tissue. But here, any photons are useful photons. In ballistic imaging, you reject all the scattered photons. You keep 
the ballistic or unscattered photons. Here you allow photons to scatter any light absorption to generate heat. In. For every millidegree temperature rise, you can expect roughly 8 millibars pressure rise. And this is really great news because the sound propagation is very transparent. So you can, with, by detecting the sound, we can get a very good image. So as a side note, when we look at this conversion, you feel like nature really helps a lot here. Because if this conversion ratio is less efficient, you may have to cook tissue in order to get a good image, in order to get good SR. Yeah. So 8 millibars is already above the noise level of a standard ultrasound transducer. So if you generate hundreds of milli-degrees, you'll get a very good signal-to-noise ratio to work with. So we have no control about this conversion. This is all material property driven. Right? So it's given the red. When the sound propagates out of the tissue, we place ultrasound transducers outside to receive the signals. From there on, it's a mathematical problem. So you can reconstruct the image by solving the math. Let me start with a very simple analogy. How do you pinpoint a single sound source, like a thunderbolt? Well, first of all, when you see lightning, you reset your stopwatch. When you hear the thunder, you can record the time delay T1. Since we know the speed of sound in the air, we multiply the speed by the time delay. We define a radius for a spherical shell on which lightning took place. If you have three such measurements centered at different locations, the intersection will pinpoint the thunderbolt. So photoacoustic CT, in essence, is just like this example, except we deal with a 3D sound source instead of a single point source. So the, the inverse algorithm is slightly more complex. Let's assume you got this 3D complex object. Of course, you don't know the distribution inside. The purpose is to figure out what's inside to provide an image. You can bathe the object with photons, allow photons to scatter again. The drone will generate photoacoustic waves. They'll propagate out. You can place a lot of transducers outside for a typical ultrasound transducer, a time T after a laser pulse. You're integrating all the pressure on this spherical shell. So that integration is called spherical radon transfer. Now, in extra CT, we deal with linear radon transfer. Here we integrate on this 2D spherical shell instead of a straight line. And Rita never inverted this problem, even though we named this transformation after him. So we had to work on this problem. A few years ago, we found a universal back projection method that works for three geometries that are standard, planar, cylindrical, and spherical. So pressure is what you detect, um, detect your position, on this spherical shell or on this detection surface. It's a function of time. So every detector is going to get a recorded time trace. And this is also different from actually CT, where you don't really have any time resolution because the speed of light is so high, so great, you can't, you can't really resolve it very well. But the speed of sound is much lower, like five orders of magnitude lower. So we can record a sound, a rival signal versus time. If you were to use the pressure only, probably time delay the signal, because when the signal arrives at the detector, there's a time delay. So when you back project it, you got to properly account for that. Then you integrate over the full solid angle, which is the detection aperture. Right? You would get a pretty good estimate of this P0 initial pressure induced by the laser pulse. But if you also include the high frequency component, which is the time derivative of the pressure with respect to time, you will get an exact solution. So this is very simple yet very powerful. This is the first set of functional photoacoustic images, which was demonstrated in a smile brain. We definitely the head, but the skin and skull were kept intact. So photons wander through the skin and the skull, reach the brain cortex. 
excited or acoustic signals. When we reconstruct, when we wiggle the whiskers on one side, the contralateral side of the brain was activated. And we can see the brain activation, which is due to the hemodynamic change in red, overlaid onto this very scale structural image. So this was very exciting at the time. In fact, since the publication of this paper in 03, the field has been grown exponentially with a doubling constant of roughly three years. So every three years, the field doubles in size in terms of number of publications. In the conference on photons plus ultrasound, right, this is called as part of Photonics West, as we know that's the largest biomedical optics conference. So since 2009, this conference became the largest in Photonics West. In 03, it was one of the smallest. And we're still growing extremely rapidly. In fact, this year was the largest by far in Photonics West. And the paper I just showed you is the most cited in the field of uh, photoacoustics. You wonder why photoacoustic tomography is so exciting? Why do so many people want to join this field? Well, my explanation is all shown in this chart. While all image modalities are complementary, photoacoustic tomography is very unique. This is the only modality that provides you multi-scale imaging, ranging from organelles, cells, tissues, all the way to organs, and do so with the same contrast mechanism, optical absorption. So why is that so important? In current practice, organelles and cells are mostly imaged optically. So you're measuring optical contrast. Tissues and organs are imaged non-optically. It's MRI, CT, ultrasound, PET, and spectrum, and whatnot. Right. So the two domains, the microscopic and macroscopic domains, are measured using different contrast mechanisms, and the images just cannot be correlated very well. And there's a huge divide between the two. So photoacoustic tomography can potentially bridge that gap. And I hope it will enable systems biology research at multiple end scales, as we know that's the future of biology. Practically speaking, I hope it will accelerate translation of microscopic lab discoveries to microscopic clinical practice. A lot of microscopic lab discoveries don't get translated into, into the clinic. You know, physicians care about tissue levels and organ levels. They don't operate on cells. Right? So if we can make that transition smoother, and the impact will be enormous. And so here I'm plotting the penetration capability versus resolution. You can see this is a scalable technique. Each bar represents a system implemented in your lab. Right? So for a given practical problem, you first have to identify how deep you need to penetrate. You come to the y-axis, identify a technology that's most suitable for your application. And then you can find out what kind of resolution we can provide you. It's going to be scalable, so we're not going to provide you one resolution at all depth. That would violate physics. So I'll show you some examples later on. So why is photoacoustic tomography so scalable? And from the ultrasound side, and you look at the resolution, in the lateral direction, it's inversely proportional to the frequency. So is the axial resolution. You look at the penetration limit, it's also inversely proportional to the frequency. So you divide the penetration limit by the axial resolution, you get roughly a constant. And very likely, that constant is about 200. And by and large, this ratio is determined by the properties of tissue. Again, we got to thank the nature for its grace, right? Because if this constant is only two, that means you only have two pixels to work with. So very likely, in most cases, we get more than 100 pixels to work with. And that means you have high resolution images to show. When we first started in this field, we used a single element ultrasound transducer just to mechanically rotate around the small animal to form an image. So you got to repeat the laser pulses and 
It's going to be a very slow process. It took us more than 20 minutes to get it to the image. In collaboration with the group at Yukon, led by Dr. Zhu, we now have a 512 element ultrasound ring array. And it has 64 channels that we can deal with A to 1 multiplexing. We can accomplish data acquisition through all 512 channels. So the data acquisition can be done within a couple of seconds. It's a lot faster than our initial system. So using this system, you can get a very good image of the cortical brains. Is there any way to dim the lights at the front at least? Um, so you can see the, the detailed features. Now, of course the question is how do you know they are true? And this is one you see with the naked eye. And this is the here, so we definitely have this area of interest. Because of the skin scattering and the skull scattering, you can't really see through the scattered tissue and get a, a, a good idea of the distribution in the cortex. And this is when we acquire this photoacoustic image down in Mesa. Afterwards, you can remove the skull. You can see all the vessel structures in the brain cortex. And you see how well our non-invasive image correlates with, it, with this invasive photograph. And this is more recent data. And we're trying to get full body 3D images. So we're scanning on the trunk of a smile. And you get different cross-sectional images shown here. You can see how well we delineate the internal structures of the smile. And this is a still shot, uh, one of the frames here. You can see kidney, GI tracts, um, and colon, right? and a few other organs. So this is getting very exciting. In fact, our next goal is to provide you functional imaging. So we can use the color. And one beauty of photoacoustic tomography is that we see what you see with the naked eye except that you have to open up the body in order to see it. We see it non-invisible. Right? And we see it beyond the visible spectrum as well. So we can use you know, infrared light. We can even use UV light if we decide to. And we're thinking of moving toward bigger animals and eventually human brains. Um, so this is a rhesus monkey head image using our system. And even by going through the skull, we can still reveal some of the features in the brain cortex. So this is getting very exciting. And now here, when the skull gets thick, and there's going to be ultrasound wavefront distortion. So this is without any correction. While we're working on correction methods, hopefully the images will get even better down the road. Even without correction, you can see some features that correlate quite well with this invasive photograph. And so we're trying to image uh, uh, neonates as our next goal, and eventually adult human brains. As we know, functional MRI right now is the main technique for functional brain imaging, um, which is you know one of the inventors uh, work here. It's a great technology. Um, but this will complement functional MRI as well, because we image hemodynamics directly, because our signal comes from hemoglobin directly. Right? So it's actually very sensitive to hemoglobin. Photoacoustic CT also comes in linear geometry. And we're working with Philips Research and adapted this commercial ultrasound machine for concurrent photoacoustic tomography. And you can see this linear ultrasound probe flanked with optical fiber bundles for light delivery with a single laser shaft will acquire data from all 128 channels. So that's extremely fast. With 128 channels of data, you get a 2D B scan image with a single laser shaft. Fundamentally speaking, this is a very fast uh, technology in terms of data acquisition. And we're targeting a number of applications using this system. And one of the key ideas is to piggyback Photoacoustic tomography on conventional ultrasound technology, which is very widely used in clinic. So making sure physicians feel comfortable adapting our new technology. If you give them a new technology, they may hesitate. If you tell them this is an add-on to photoacoustic, this is an add-on to ultrasound imaging, right? They already feel comfortable using ultrasound. 
and they may be more receptive. We can use this to image reporter genes, and this is like gene, IZ gene, in the end you get a blue product. We can see the blue product very well using this technique. Using standard um, reporter genes such as GFP, green fluorescence proteins, you depend on fluorescence for imaging. So you run into this problem, you either get high resolution at a very shallow depth or you lose the resolution. So here, even with 5 centimeter penetration, we're still getting sub-millimeter resolution. And so this is going to expand the capability of reporter gene imaging. We're also targeting a clinical application for breast cancer staging. In the, in the standard clinical practice, we have to cut open the breast, visually identify the simple lymph node, dissect the node for histology. 80% of the patients who go through this procedure turn out to be negative, which is good news that you have to find out the answer through a surgery. We're trying to convert this surgical procedure into a needle biopsy procedure, which can be done on an outpatient basis. So the first goal is to identify the simple lymph node through optical dye and which is used in the standard surgical procedure anyway. And you can see the accumulation of the dye very well at the central lymph node. This was done in a small animal. And then we can guide the needle toward identifying the central lymph node, which we can pinpoint. And the contrast of the needle is very high, it's about 8 to 1. You can also use ultrasound to guide the needle, but the contrast is very low. It's more or less like 1.2 to 1. One of the key questions for optical imaging is penetration. How deep can we image? So we have to answer that question. And we first did uh, using external uh, ex vivo tissue. And you can see this 7 centimeter penetration. Uh, you know, very reliable using this technology. So this was done ex vivo. So the question is, what about in vivo? So we have to test it ultimately in vivo. Very recently, we started clinical imaging using this technology. And we're very excited to see that even at a depth of 6 centimeters, we can still see features. Uh, this is in a human in vivo. And we're doing more studies trying to figure out uh, what these features represent. Well, the real goal of this study is to perform breast cancer staging. So we need to identify the central lymph node. So 22 minutes after the dye injection, so this study we use methylene blue, which our surgeon uses in a standard procedure. And you can see the accumulation of the dye very well. This has a very high contrast. You know, it's more than six, 60 over 10, so that's 6 to 1. Okay. Now if you were to use x-ray CT for soft tissue imaging, most likely you get like 1% contrast. So this is extremely exciting. Obviously, it's going to take more patients to complete the study. And the next thing is to guide the needle to take some tissue out um, for histology or cytology. And once this is done, of course, our ultimate goal is to totally avoid the surgery for breast cancer staging. Now, on the map I just showed you, where you have deep tissue imaging, but you also have microscopy, where you don't have to penetrate that deep. And our initial goal is to penetrate a few millimeters, but you're still beyond the optical diffusion limit. So that's the acoustic resolution version. In photoacoustic CT, we're using the powerful math um, to reconstruct an image. But in photoacoustic microscopy, we use the powerful physics to get an image. So assuming there's an optically absorbing target, you fire as a pulse onto the sample, you generate a photoacoustic wave, then we use a focused ultrasound transducer to receive the signal. So the time of arrival of the signal will give you depth. We know the speed of sound very well in soft tissue. And the acoustic focus can be transverse resolution. Right. 
And this is very much like optical focus. But except the acoustics, you see the lens is a little strange. In optics, if you see this concave lens, most likely it's an active lens. But in acoustics, it's the opposite. <clears throat> the reason is that uh, the speed of sound is actually faster in solid than in liquid. And this coupling medium is either gel coupled or liquid coupled. This is like the refractive index being less than one. Right? In optics, of course, in most cases, the refractive index is greater than one. So this time trace detected by this transducer is converted into a 1D image, depth resolved image. This target is going to show up as a spike. You can scan along the tissue surface to get a 2D scan image. Or you can master scan on the tissue surface to get a 3D image. This is the first 3D photo with a microscope. You start from a laser. You like to tune the laser wavelength so you can identify the color. Color of the absorber. We use optical fiber to route the beam. You can see the solid beam coming out, which is converted into a hollow cone beam through this conical lens or axicon. And this hollow beam is refocused, as shown in this close-up, into the tissue. On the tissue surface, you have this donut beam with a dark core. The core is dark just to minimize the surface interference signal. And the ultrasound detection is comfortable with your light illumination region, just to maximize the signal demonstration. So you see this inverting window right here which couples light and sound. And the tissue to the image is placed below the membrane window. And so you can raster scan this head within this water tray to get a 3D image. This was one of the first images acquired just to demonstrate how deep we can penetrate. So at 50 megahertz ultrasound frequency, which is considered very high frequency in ultrasound, you can penetrate about three millimeters. And this is highly scalable. If you were to use a lower frequency, you can penetrate deeper, and vice versa. So with this system, you can get 50 micron actual resolution. That means you get about 200 pixels in the depth spectrum. Mm -hmm. The lab resolution is about 45 microns. Data acquisition is about 2 microseconds for each case scan. You don't have the average. And this is in the super depth range for microscopy already. And you can even scale this in both directions. So you can penetrate much deeper. You have in our lab, we scaled up to about three centimeters, and that's not even the limit. We can also image melanoma because the melanin concentration is high in most melanoma. And we can also image now image the surrounding blood vessel network due to the intrinsic hemoglobin. So we're not injecting anything. Most likely, if you were to use extra CT to image blood vessels, you got to inject iodine-based contrast. Okay. So this is a composite image showing you both blood and melanoma. And if you look at the contrast and see how high they are. We're moving this technology toward melanoma imaging in the clinic. And you can see, we can see our own palm very well using intrinsic contrast. You can see the blood vessels. And looking at a depth result image, you can identify all the standard structures in the skin. This technology also works well with nanotechnologies. A lot of nanoparticles are optically absorbing, so they can provide excellent contrast for photoacoustic tomography. For this particular study, we use nano cages. If you use just passive nano cages, you would get some contrast. But by working with the inventor of nano cages, Dr. Shah, now we conjugate nano cages to target nanocytes stimulating hormone receptors. The targeted version will give you a threefold increase in contrast. So this is much more effective in terms of absorption, in terms of uh, accumulation around the tumor. Dr. Shah is also interested in loading the nano cages with drug. 
and wrap the nano cages, just seal the pores around the nano cages. And when you heat up the nano cages, you would, the polymers will shrink, open up the pores so the drug will release. And when you let the nano cages cool down, the polymers will seal the pores again. So you can come back and do repetitive treatment in a controlled fashion. And we can monitor the treatment process using this technology for imaging. We can also miniaturize the device to make an endoscope. So this is the first photo endoscope. The key component is right here. You got a rotating mirror surface that reflects both light and sound. So you deliver light through this optical fiber. Light is reflected into the tissue, generates a photoacoustic wave, and the photoacoustic wave comes back, gets reflected by this scanning surface, gets detected in ultrasound transmission. Now, ultrasound transmission has to be a little coupled. It doesn't like air. This micromotor doesn't like liquid. So this side is for magnet. We transfer the torque through this pair of magnets. You can see this device in action. So we tested this device in a rapid esophagus in vivo. As you pull back, you can see the features in the rabbit esophagus. In standard optical endoscopy, we got a limit in penetration to about a millimeter. And a lot of lesions can be beyond that depth. So physicians want to have a deeper penetration capability. They prescribed about three millimeters or so. Our device can penetrate about seven millimeters in the current version. And we can image using both photoacoustics and ultrasound. And so you've got dual contrast mechanisms through the same device. Photoacoustic microscopy also comes in optical resolution where you're back within the optical diffusion limit. So you don't really strive for very deep penetration, but you want to get you know, the best resolution. So within the diffusion limit, we can optically focus to achieve transfer resolution defined by the optical focal beam spot size. And this bed portion represents the light focused into the tissue. The key component is right here, which combines the optical axis with the acoustic axis. This component is made of two prisms, <coughs> separated with a gap, and the gap is filled with liquid. So the optical refractive indices are well matched along the optical axis, giving you high transmission of light. However, the acoustic impedance between the liquid in the gap and the solid in the prism are highly mismatched, giving you a very high reflection of sound, so that photoacoustic signal will be reflected through this ultrasound transducer. By focusing light using various numerical apertures, you can get different resolutions. And so, for example, one of the versions gives you about 2.6 micron transverse resolution. So for this version, we had 5 micron transverse resolution. As we know, the smallest blood vessels, capillaries, have average diameter of 5 to 7 microns. So at this resolution, you can see the smallest blood vessels already. And we use this to study angiogenesis. Our collaborator, Dr. Arba, used to sacrifice animals at different time points in order to build a database like this and he had, he had to deal with intersubject vulnerability. Here we monitor the same animal over a period of 60 days. And you can see increasing vessel density and increasing vessel tortuosity. And this is a 3D rendering of the same data set. More recently, we improved the resolution to 2.6 microns in the transverse direction. And so it allows you to see all the vessels even in greater detail. And this is a mouse here image using our technology without injecting any contrast agents. Everything is intrinsic. You can see all vessels in this volume. You gotta zoom into a small area to see the details. You can see this capillary bed 
you see a bunch of single calories, and all these stars are single red blood cells. And so you're at a single cell level resolution already using intrinsic contrast. That's a 3D rendering. Now, there are two forms of hemoglobin in the body, oxy and deoxy. And the ratio is very important. So the amount of oxygen concentration over the total concentration volume is called oxygen saturation. By tuning the laser wavelength, we can quantify the concentrations of both forms of hemoglobin, from which we compute the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. And so you can map how the blood vessels are functioning physiologically. And red indicates very high oxygen saturation, as we know arteries have higher oxygen saturation levels than veins. So we can color code arteries and veins. So red are arteries, and blue or green indicate um, veins. So we're essentially doing single blood vessel oximetry. You might have heard of pulse oximetry, which is very widely used in the OR or in the hospital in general. Right, so that really volume averages and doesn't really measure vein uh, oxygen saturation, only measures arterial saturation, it requires pulses. So this is single level oxygen saturation. We uh, reduce the resolution or improve it to about 0.9 microns. And at this resolution, you can see single red blood cells, you can see the donut shape in the single red blood cells. We also use the same technique to see this intersusceptive angiogenesis. You see this hole dri being drilled in this single blood vessel. Right? You might have heard of uh, sprouting angiogenesis as the most common form. You grow a vessel all together. But here, you got a vessel in there that you drill a hole through. All biologically done. It's an amazing mechanism. Right? So that vessel is split into two vessels. And before this point, all studies were based on electron microscopy. So that means you have to sacrifice the animal in order to get an image. Now we're doing this in vivo. So that means you can monitor this over time. Hopefully it will reveal some new biology. This is also very recent data. We're trying to push this technology to the extreme in terms of oximetry. We talked about single vessel oximetry, now we're talking about single cell oximetry. So you want to monitor a single cell as it flows through a capillary and watch its oxygen saturation. And so you can see the cells coming in tend to have very high oxygen saturation in the red. As you fly through, they release the oxygen. So they go to a much lower oxygen saturation. Each dot represents a single of us now as they fly through. And we work with a neurologist. He's interested in Alzheimer's disease in a small model. Um, so he can tolerate the removal of the scalp, the skin, but keep the skull intact. Because the minute that you remove the skull, you cause a lot of artifacts. If you were to use confocal or two photon microscopy, then you gotta thin the skull or sometimes remove the skull. So that's undesirable. And we can keep the full thickness of the skull, you can get a very detailed map of the blood vessels. If I can also stain the skull by injecting methylene blue, you can stain this, the vessel structure within the skull. So this can be very powerful for neurological applications. Human applications. We use our own finger. This is single capillaries in our finger cuticle. Right? There are hairpin like capillary loops. And you can zoom into a smaller area. We can quantify the oxygen saturation. These are color coded. You can zoom into a single hairpin capillary loop. On one side, you have very high oxygen saturation. On the other side, you have very low oxygen saturation. So that means most of the oxygen is unloaded at the tip of the capillary. And this is entirely new observation. We cannot find any report anywhere else. And we're still trying to figure out what's going on there. Why is oxygen unloaded preferentially at the tip, not uniformly along the propagation around the loop? So hopefully we'll, we'll learn some new physiology there. 
What is the limit in resolution? Well, you can try to improve your RNA, improve the neural aperture, and we push that to the extreme. We use the water inversion lens, so we got an NA of 1.2, and allowed us to improve the transverse res resolution to about 220 nanometers. Right? And we use this device to image a single nanoparticle, a single nanoparticle cage, which is about 40 nanometers in dimension. And you can see this half width at half maximum of the PSF, of the point spread function, being about 110 nanometers. We can also try to image cell nuclei. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've heard of histology or pathology, which means you have to cut the tissue away from the patient, slice them up, stain them, and then look at them under the microscope. Obviously, that's invasive. And what you do is you look at the cell nuclei distribution. So we asked ourselves the question, can we do histology in vivo and look at the cell nuclei distribution? And what we did was to target DNA and RNA absorption. As we know, cell nuclei have high concentrations of DNAs and RNAs. Sure enough, if you target DNA and RNA absorption, you can see the distribution of cell nuclei. It's the individual cell nuclei. And this same piece of tissue was later on processed using standard histology. Of course, that requires staining. This is unstained. Everything is made to you, contrast. Right. So this can be potentially very useful. And one of the initial applications we're thinking about is mold surgery. And that's for skin cancer removal. The surgeons have to remove whatever is visible. You know, when there's a skin cancer, the bulk of the cancer is visible. There is pigmentation going on. And then there's some other cancer cells that are invisible to the naked eye. They have to cut a tissue, send it to pathology. The pathologist said it's all clear, then you're done with the surgery. If the pathologist says, no, there are still cancer cells, you gotta cut more. Clear region, make sure the margin is clear. Cancer, you send the tissue to your pathologist again and hope everything's clear. Sometimes you go through this loop several times. Now, if we can image the cell nuclear distribution just like the, what pathologists can see through a microscope in X vivo. Now you're doing everything in vivo. You identify everything on the spot. You can finish the, the surgery on a single go. Right? So that's one of our goals here. And you can probably imagine there are some other applications. Brain cancer surgery or even a clear margin. Right? Now, I just talked about oxygen saturation imaging. We can also quantify the total concentration of hemoglobin. That correlates with hematocrit. That's a very important physiological parameter as well. There is photoacoustic Doppler effect, which was first reported by our lab only about four years ago. And now we're using the photoacoustic Doppler effect to image blood flow, so you can quantify the velocity. Now, in addition to these three parameters, we can obviously quantify the perception of individual blood vessels. We can identify a region of interest using our imaging. So you're talking about five different parameters which are all measured intrinsically. So photoacoustic tomography is the only technique that allows you to quantify all these five parameters. Using these five intrinsic parameters, you can quantify a very important physiological parameter, which is the metabolic rate of oxygen. Right? Why is that important? As we know, metabolism is life, right? And cancer has a problem with metabolism. So can we use metabolism to detect cancer at the possible, at the earliest possible stage? So we tested this te technique in a small animal model. And you can see on day seven, this cancerous region has increased metabolic rate of oxygen. Right? It's much higher. But very surprisingly, usually hypermetabolism indicates hypoxia, meaning it draws so much oxygen out of the bloodstream, so the bloodstream has a lower oxygen saturation. But in this case, it's the opposite. You see this tumor hyperoxia going on here. It's 
So this is very surprising. And the reason is that the hypermetabolism initiated angiogenesis. You grow so many more new blood vessels, so you overcompensate for the consumption of the oxygen. Right? In the end, you still have access in oxygen within the bloodstream. <coughs> so the argument is the metabolic rate of oxygen could be much more fundamental to measure in order to diagnose cancer early. A quick discussion. So in addition to light, what else can we use? <coughs> right, there's this EM spectrum and we still want to be done as radiation. Right, so if you use radio frequency waves or microwaves, you can penetrate much deeper. As we know, MRI is actually based on radio frequency waves. You can penetrate through the whole body. And I still have this dream that one day our modalities will use through the whole body of humans, not just swallows. So here we used a 3, mic three gigahertz microwave generator. And that allows you to penetrate much deeper, in fact, than light. And we imaged human breast uh, mastectomy specimens. You can see a very good contrast. This one, for, for example, has a 5 to 1 contrast. And so we're going to apply this in the clinic. Our initial application is breast cancer chemotherapy monitoring using this technique. Let me just use one slide to um, report a recent development, which is called time reversed ultrasound encoded or true optical focusing. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to focus light beyond one millimeter in the skin. However, using this method, we might be able to focus much deeper. And in astronomy, we've been using a guide star to correct the distortion due to the atmosphere. In biological tissue, we don't have a guide star. So what we do is to use ultrasound again, because ultrasound scatter is so low, we can focus ultrasound to wherever we want. The ultrasound beam is able to encode coherent laser light propagating through the ultrasound beam. The encoded portion is going to have a different frequency. So outside the tissue, we can record the ultrasound encoded light and reject the unencoded light. So the background light is all rejected. And we can use a phase conjugation mirror to time reverse the conjugated component or the encoded component. So the encoded component will all go back to the ultrasound beam as shown by the green. So maybe let's just wait for one more cycle. You can see light go through. Some of the light will be ultrasound tagged. They turn into green. We record them and send them back. And the background light that bypasses the ultrasound beam will be rejected. They won't be sent back. Right? This is very much similar to um, adaptive optics. Right? But now there's hope that we can focus much deeper into biological tissue. And this can impact everything you do with light, including imaging, sensing, manipulation, and therapy. Right? You've heard of optogenetics. Right now, the, in order to work at a deeper region, you have to use optical fibers, so that's invasive. You might have heard of photodynamic therapy. Right now, it's hard to treat a tumor that's deeply seated. So if you can focus onto the tumor, you can treat much deeper. A quick summary. Photoacoustic tomography is achieved by using optical excitation and ultrasonic detection. The diffusion limit has been broken at super depths up to seven centimeters have been reached. Single cap or even single cells can be resolved in vivo. We've demonstrated about 220 nanometers resolution. Multi-scale imaging is achieved by scaling the depth and resolution. In most cases, we simply vary the ultrasonic bandwidth. Background free detection is built in. So that means that when there's no absorption, there's no signal which is the most ideal situation in engineering, as we know. You always want to have the background-free option if you have it. 
in fact, photoacoustics has the highest sensitivity to alpha absorption at 100%. So that's the highest among all modalities. In fact, if you compare this with OCT, photoacoustics is 250 times more sensitive to absorption. Of course, OCT is more sensitive in scattering, so the two technologies are highly complementary. Either non fluorescent or fluorescent pigments can be detected. So basically, any molecules are absorbing. It's a matter of finding the right wavelength. Multiple chromophores can be resolved spectrally. Functional imaging comes from indigenous contrast. Molecular imaging comes from targeted contrast. Reporter genes can be imaged, and Doppler imaging of blood flow has been demonstrated. Frame rates can be very high, listing two numbers, representative numbers. In fact, in the lab, we even achieve much higher frame rates. There are no spec artifacts, very different from OCT images or from ultrasound images. Only non S radiation is used, it's very safe to use. The systems are relatively low cost. However, we do require contact measurements, so this is different from OCT. Um, we usually use gel or liquid for coupling purposes. Cavities and very thick bones attenuate the ultrasound, and so we are imaging through the skull, but for human skull, it's even thicker. So uh, we actually got signals, so we think there's high hope there. Um, there's this book, Gabby yeah, mentioned earlier, so if you're interested, there's a chapter on photoacoustic tomography. This is a much more detailed report. Um, we edited it, and most of the experts in this field contributed to this book. We do have openings in the lab. If you're interested in more details, please visit our website. Credit goes to my lab members, so this bad names indicate uh, major contributors to this talk. Thank you very much. Oh, 
filter into the living tissue. So have you talked about independent component analysis? Yeah, you have to explain to me what it does first. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. basically, okay, so this is like a cocktail party problem. Where, for example, if you imagine there is a cocktail party and you try to say, okay, can you, can you reconstruct the speech of each person individually? Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's this is the very mathematical way of doing this. If you have enough uh, detectors, numbers of detectors, which they call the numbers of sources, then you can reconstruct each one's speech. So we, so can you do we, we assume every pixel is unknown. Mm -hmm. So we got enough measurements mm -hmm. to figure out them anyway. Yeah. Now, once you have the image, you can analyze any way you want. Exactly. So this is just to make a better image. So you want to you want to analyze the image. Yeah, to say, oh, so this is the background, this is not what I want. Mm. I want this. Okay. Because this improves the resolution frequency. So maybe we can have some more discussion on flight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I see it in the other here. Okay. Yeah. So, you know? No, in imaging, you encoded the space of location. Mm -hmm. So we start with a deterministic. I say machine and you have the processes. You try to supplement out. In this case, how many pixels you have? 256 by 256. Yeah. In order to separate in our using ICA, that's the power. So that's the ingenious uh, physical principle here. Yeah, we able to encode the spatial location of the signal. Yeah. So the But when is the cocktail party, by the way? No. <laughs> Someone play music and talk. <laughs> so you have a microphone recording the mixed signal. And you try to separate out the noise from the music. No, no vocabulary not for this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any other question?
didn't have an output of torque, and so we had to make an output of torque to do it. So there may be some uh, potential applications for photoacoustics. Yeah, please. Would your constant conversion of this your time scale for the scan that you showed for that? So it's getting faster and faster. That single cell, that, um, I, that movie was a part of 20 frames per second. So, and if I were pushing that to 80 meg, 80 hertz, 80 frames per second, so you can make it real fast. Intrinsically, uh, your ultimate speed is limited by the acoustic arrival time. Um, so, speed of, the speed of sound is 1,500 meters per second. Within a millisecond, you propagate 1.5 meters. So, if you're only using 1.5 millimeters, one microsecond is one beat. It's very fast. Great. So we'll be here all night, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think it would be possible to use similar technology to observe electrical communication in the brain? I mean, you were able to see the obstacle or improvement. Would you be able to see it? So you want to see the electrical signal? Yeah. That relevant proposal, I didn't get funded. <laughs> So, it's, it's a very interesting question you, you asked. Um, with a standard bioelectric signal, um, it's, it's very low frequency because the uh, EEG signals may last like milliseconds. So, you're talking about roughly kilohertz. I think of it as an EM signal, but it's very low frequency. As a result, the wavelength is like kilometers long, so you don't really get resolution very well. And that's why standard EEG mapping doesn't give you good spatial mapping. You don't know where the signal comes from. It's just integrated over a whole head, pretty much. So I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. You know, how can we get spatial information out of the brain? So the idea I proposed, so I'm not joking, it's a real proposal. Um, I want to use ultrasound to encode bioelectric signals. Basically, very much like MRI. The MRI, as we know, the, the B-field gradient we encode space with different resonance frequencies. So here we use a chirped ultrasound. You can chirp the ultrasound again because the ultrasound propagates relatively slowly. And you take a snapshot of the ultrasound wave, you get different frequencies along the axis. So that's like frequency encoding in MRI. We're encoding bioelectric signals. Every position has a unique frequency. And then outside the brain, we can, you know, you integrate all the signals from everywhere, but we can do a Fourier transformation and associate different frequencies with different locations. So if that works, that would be able to map the brain just by using electrical signal. But I have yet to convince our reviewers. <laughs>